tallest buildings in Yorkshire are all located within Leeds. This was one of the first northern cities to embrace the high-rise in the 1960s. As a forerunner of high-rise architecture, this has left it with a legacy of tall buildings. Some are good, some are bad. So why does Leeds have so many tall buildings of poor quality? Historically, the tallest building in any city in the UK was either a church or a cathedral. However, in the late 1800s, this all began to change. Civic buildings began as the new tall buildings to demonstrate civic pride and civic wealth. From 1858, the tallest building in Leeds was the Town Hall, complete with its domed tower. This stone building is now small on the skyline compared to the other skyscrapers and towers that exist. The Town Hall was originally designed as a municipal palace to demonstrate the civic pride and civic wealth of the area, and this held the top spot for 108 years. The tallest building would then change in 1966 when the Royal Exchange House was built. This office block would take the title as the tallest building in Leeds. For the next period of time, offices were all the rage in the city centre and these were dominating the skyline. This demonstrated Leeds changing from a manufacturing hub into a service-based economy. Leeds, similar to many other northern cities, saw a process of deindustrialization during the 1960s and 70s. Therefore, during this time, economic development was slow. However, some notable office towers were constructed during this time period. Originally known as Royal Exchange House, or more commonly known now as the Park Plaza Hotel. From 1966 to 1972, this was the tallest building in Leeds. Originally constructed as an office block, now converted into a hotel. This is very distinctive on the skyline for all the wrong reasons. Since its refurbishment, this has been clad in a grey panelling with some glazing to break up the facade. The refurbishment leaves a lot to be desired, standing as a grey lump above the city centre, neither adding to or contributing to its variety. Prior to the refurbishment, this was a modernist looking office block with concrete panelling and glazing to break up. This had a rhythmical appearance that actually did stand out as quite striking. The refurbishment, however, is almost criminal in the way it disregarded the entire look and feel of the building and just stuck panelling on it. However, the changing needs of office space and the greater and greater floor plates that were required meant that office buildings like this were soon left to the wayside. The conversion to the hotel is the reason this tower is really still standing and is the reason it has such a poor design quality. The office developments during the 1960s and 70s can be clearly seen through developments such as the Pinnacle. The Pinnacle is a 20-storey tower which sits above the retail streets below. There's a striking juxtaposition with the 4-5 to storey retail streets and this 20-storey tower sitting above it. Unlike the Park Plaza tower, the Pinnacle has been refurbished but not in such a drastic way to take away its modernistic character. This is by no means a poor design tower, however it is a product of its time and it stands heavy on the skyline. This is made worse by the recent refurbishment including the name The Pinnacle on top of the building as a branding exercise that really stands out. Another former office block exists to the north of the Pinnacle, known as K2, or previously known as Dudley House. This is another 20-storey building, constructed in 1972. Following this, the building has then again been reclad and turned into residential apartments this time. The building sits on a podium of offices within a city block. Whilst the overall design of this building is bland, the balconies that jut out from this actually do break up the facade a little more than Park Plaza Hotel. However, this really marks a moment in time in the early 2000s when residential flats were flying up in Leeds and obviously the demand or the potential for demand was so great that office buildings etc were converted. This is another building that's built in the early 2000s and unfortunately subject to the poor design quality that often featured during this time period. This can be said to be another tower that harms the skyline. The increasingly that we should preserve these buildings, that they are, they do tell an important story. Um, they're part of the history of the built environment of the city. And whilst they may not be the most necessarily the most interesting buildings, what they represent 
in terms of the post-war transition from um, you know uh, a city that was that was still heavily industrial, maybe to a to move towards a city that had a, a mixture of uh, industries and and, and, and working um, environments. I think they're quite important in that regard. Following the Second World War in Britain, there was a significant housing shortage. With the need to construct homes at a rate not seen before, modern methods of construction were employed to achieve this. Factory productions of homes was an option explored during this time, with prefabricated parts being constructed on site. The core example of this that can be seen throughout Britain is the Point Block Flat. This aimed at streamlining construction in order to meet the housing demand. Built in 1964, the Oatland Tower is a series of residential blocks located to the north of Leeds Inner Ring Road. The tower itself is 17 storeys tall, however, when viewed from the road, this doesn't actually appear to be as tall due to the height difference. This is another tower that's been renovated with a render and green panelling placed over the original concrete panelling. There are numerous other examples of high rises of social housing or previously built with social housing in the city. And Oatland Tower is not an exceptional or notable variety of this, but serves to demonstrate the type of accommodation that was built at this time that actually sits within the skyline. These high rises also demonstrate uh, a time period when there was a commitment by the government or to provide high quality social homes for all of its residents. Following the 1968 Ronan Point disaster, where a gas explosion significantly damaged the structure of the point block, Many residents began to express their concerns with feeling unsafe within these tower blocks. With this opposition and a change of government interests, widespread social housing provision would never be seen at this scale in Britain again. It's left cities such as Leeds with a significant housing stock of high rise flats. A number of refurbishments have taken place to these. Some of these aim to hide concrete panelling behind cladding. However, since the Grenfell disaster, there's been a wider scrutiny of the type of cladding used on these buildings. Under New Labour, Leeds was the northern poster boy for regeneration. In just 10 years, 7,000 new apartments were built within the city centre, with a further 3,000 under construction in 2008 and 7,000 with plan permission. Of all these new apartments built between 1998 and 2008, it was estimated that around 75% were sold to private investors. However, by the late 2000s, it was estimated that 20% of these new flats were actually empty. This speculation on apartments in the city led to a massive oversupply and this development changed the city centre of Leeds more so than any other city in the north until the rise of Manchester within recent years. Leeds most iconic tower is often referred to as a Dalek, otherwise known as Bridgewater Place. This white geometric beacon was the tallest building in Yorkshire for 14 years. It rises to 32 floors. This consists of offices at the lower ground level and then residential apartments above. This building has received criticism for its geometric form and cheap panelling that appear on it. This is a building that really looks out of place on a British skyline and is not something I expect to see in a northern city. Further to the criticisms about design, this tower has had a further impact, and that is the wind microclimate has created. The design of the tower unfortunately created a wind microclimate. This was able to overturn a lorry onto a pedestrian, with the wind forces created from this tower set to be 80 miles an hour. Now, at the base of the tower, there are giant metallic sails. These appear as almost motorway gantries. Whilst easily criticizable for its white panelling and geometric shapes. This tower is iconic in its own way. It's easily distinguishable as Leeds or Bridgewater Place or the Dalek. And this forms a key marker of the southern part of the city centre. Candle House is located to the south of Leeds train station and is an example of an irregular floor plate tower. This 23-storey tower contains offices, flats, and at ground floor level some retail space. This circular design and its relationship with Leeds train station 
creates a real marker for the city centre of Leeds, with this being visible from the train. The floors twist as this building climbs vertically. The brick cladding used also ties into the viaduct arches that Leeds train station is built on. Constructed in 2009, this is actually only built two years after Bridgewater Place, but the difference in design and quality of materials is really striking. To me, this is one of the examples of Leeds' best looking tall buildings. At the centre of the Royal Armoury's regeneration is Clarence House. This is a 20 storey building which overlooks Leeds Dock. This creates a visual bookend to the end of this development and features a spiral, almost crown, that tops off the tower. However, the design shows its weakness when viewed from any other angle other than the front. When you view it from the side or the back, outside of the Leeds Dock area, what you're greeted with is quite a, an expansive, white rendered wall that has very little to break it up. Whilst this tower is one of the better additions to the skyline, the poor rear elevation really sets to demonstrate how paper thin the regeneration of Leeds Dock actually is. The collapse of Leeds residential market in the late 2000s can best be seen by two unbuilt proposals. These, if built, would have become the tallest residential buildings in Western Europe. An interesting point is actually throughout history, when a world's tallest or a region's tallest building is often built, it often precedes an economic crash. For example, the Empire State Building being built during the Great Depression, or the Burj Khalifa also being completed just before the 2008 economic crash. This similar phenomenon was also replicated in Leeds with two unbuilt towers, one called Criterion Place and the other called Lumiere. Lumiere would have been a 55 storey tower located to the west of Leeds City Centre. However, due to the 2008 economic crash, this was never actually built. Secondly is Criterion Place, consisting of two towers connected to the base. This would have been a 53 storey tower, however its design would have meant it would actually have been 8 metres taller than Lumiere. This would have been located to the south of Leeds train station, and another project that was cancelled due to the 2008 economic crash. The rise in student numbers in the past two decades has also shaped the face of Leeds. The new Labour government allowed all those individuals that wanted to go to the university to be able to, and this resulted in such an increase in student numbers in cities. No longer could university run and houses of multiple occupation provide enough student capacity for all these students to live in. New towers in the sky were needed in order to cope with the demand. This expansion has also seen numerous properties aimed individually at the international student market as well. What has changed in Leeds is the architecture of the northern portion of the city surrounding the arena quarter. Rising around the arena is a sea of cladding and geometric shapes offering ensuite living and gated communities for the sanity of mum back home. The student market is vastly different to the private rented market for flats. Instead of individual viewings, these are often undertaken on open days with students herded between blocks of flats. The student's main concern is the moving away from mum and dad and the design of the building is unfortunately put to the wayside. As a captive market, the student developers know this, installing small windows, large gated areas, as well as bright, garish cladding. Whilst these buildings result in development and bring thousands and numbers of people to Leeds during the term time, the impact on the skyline has been notable around the arena quarter. As a contrast to the aforementioned student housing of poor quality, there are a few examples of high design quality. One of these is Broadcasting Tower. This is located to the north of the city's ring road. This consists of a low-rise section housing the Faculty of Arts, Environment and Technology for Leeds Beckett Uni. This connects in with the existing street scene and whilst its uh, rusted appearance does stand out, this culminates with a tower at one end. The tower consists of student flats and consists of three blocks of which these are set at different angles to create an overhang. In terms of student accommodation, this is one of the highest design qualities within 
the whole market. And this is represented and this has won numerous awards for its design. Vita Student are one of the providers of student accommodation that often take the highest pride within their designs. And Vita Student buildings are some are often the best looking ones within the, any city. The Vita Student Tower, located within the Arena Court, has a very difficult setting. This is located adjacent to Leeds Inner Ring Road, with the tower actually overlooking the concrete walls that this ring road runs through. To the other side, the building adjoins a small park, which other student accommodation is located around. The design of the tower itself is actually rather blocky, with only three steps in height to break up its mass, and it has quite a long mass against the inner ring road. However, where this building does come to shine is the use of cladding. It's got this ceramic cladding with a rich texture that adds a lot of variety and visual interest to the building. When viewed up close, this really stands out striking and a real high quality cladding in contrast to some of the buildings I'll mention later in this video. This building is only 18 stories in height and is now being dwarfed by some of the later student developments now in progress. The main cluster of Leeds student accommodation is formed around Atlas House and the arena. This area features a number of buildings of different architectural styles. This is crowned by Atlas House, which is the tallest building in Yorkshire and said to be the tallest student accommodation building in Northern Europe. This consists of Atlas House and two other blocks of different heights that form a student accommodation in this area. Atlas House was such a tall building has a rather blocky design and has very little to crown off as the tallest building. This features a white stone cladding which does little to break up the mass of the building. The verticality of the glazing is the most interesting feature of this building. Where the building hits the ground there is a small plaza with a few seats but this is rather minute in comparison to the size of the building. The student market has allowed for the creation of some buildings which otherwise wouldn't be as easily supported. This can be clearly seen with two buildings, Sky Plaza and Opal 3. A characteristic of the design is the cheap cladding, especially used within these two towers. Opal 3 has an angular crown on top, which resembles a fin, but this is otherwise a blocky and bland tower on the skyline. These are some of the worst additions to Leeds skyline and stand as monuments to the rise of student numbers within the city. The future of student house in Leeds is often questioned with people speculating that too much supply has been built with not enough demand and this will echo the Leeds crash. However, the core reason for investing in student flats is to ease pressure from the housing market by encouraging students to take student flats rather than moving into house on multiple occupation. This in turn creates more housing supply for regular people. If student numbers were to drop in the future, it is possible for some of these buildings to be converted into non-residential use, as a lot of them would have floor plans that are more easily adaptable. So the starting point is it's a good thing. Yeah. I, I think where we are critical is of the designs of some of these buildings. Um, we are concerned about some of the practicalities about how they work, because if you cluster thousands of people in a very small footprint and people that tend to arrive, you know, at the start term and then go home at the end of term, you've got these big, you know, waves of people coming and going and just managing that is actually just practically quite difficult. They tend to have very little amenity space attached to them, very little amenity space, uh, certainly no public, no personal amenity, amenity space, a bit of shared space, which again is, is something that we wouldn't necessarily accept for uh, in inverted commas, normal residential accommodation. So why should we accept that for student accommodation? Um, and, you know, what we've seen uh, by default is the arena area turning into a student city. Now, that hasn't really been planned. So the council over the years, the council have a, a tall building strategy, but it's kind of, it, it, it kind of, if I'm honest, is about almost acknowledging what has already happened rather than saying this is what should happen. The rise of towers can now be seen across all city centres in the UK with either proposals in place or actual towers being constructed. Multiple cities now are all completing their tallest building, as is the case in Leeds, Manchester and Newcastle. This could be due to a number of factors, such as the cost of land in cities, the difficulty of the planning process, 
or developers really wanting to maximise the value of the land they have. But how does Leeds actually plan its high-rises? So Leeds actually has a tall building supplementary planning document and this is rather detailed. So why has Leeds approved so many tall buildings of poor quality? So a lot of, a lot has happened since then. I mean, the, 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 the building, I think, that fe some of the buildings that feature in the document were never built. <laughs> so it, it was actually based, so that gives you a clue that it was kind of a bit of a reaction to what we thought might be happening in the city at the time. But then the recession hit in the 2009 recession and, 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 and some of those buildings just didn't happen. So some of the very tall buildings that I suspect were the reason why the council felt they had to have a policy, they didn't actually happen. Um, but then the policy um, has, I mean, it, it, it rarely seems to get referred to. I, it, it's not a policy that you hear um, uh, officers particularly referring to. Um, the, the, the plans panels, you know, very rarely sort of say, oh, you know, well, the policy says this, this doesn't fit with the policy. It's kind of been forgotten to an extent. And so what's happened instead is that buildings are looked at on a case by case basis. The guidance that Leeds has for tall buildings is some of the best guidance there actually is. In contrast uh, to Newcastle tall building guidance, which is much lacklustre in comparison, and Manchester, the now northern home for the skyscraper, has no tall building guidance at all. Manchester has been very lucky with the Renacre developments around Deansgate. This has created an area or a cluster of skyscrapers, all of high design quality with similar visual appearance. In contrast, Leeds has been a result of a, a piecemeal approach of student housing as well as residential apartments all built throughout different periods of time. The result is that Deansgate Square in Manchester has a greater visual cohesion than Leeds skyline. Further contrast could also be drawn that Leeds' is market is aimed more at the student market whereas Deansgate Square is more aimed at the upper end of the residential market. This difference in market often result in different buildings and also the quality materials used. <laughs>